Okay, so I had a request for lesson four, study guide. So that's as good a place as any to start. Um, so we'll just begin here. So I'm gonna work through the study guide and I'll bring up some figures and pictures for us to talk about as we go. So first of all, let's talk about the cell theory. There's basically three things about the cell theory that we need to know. And the first one is the cell is the basic unit of life. So in other words, the cell is the smallest division we can get where we still consider something alive. And all living things are made of cells. And that's why we don't consider viruses living because viruses are too small. They don't have any cells. And the last part of the cell theory is that cells come from other cells. Now, there are two basic types of cells, eukaryotic and prokaryotic. So it's hard for me to write in a small space, but I'm going to do my best. Okay, eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells. And the main difference between those two is simply that, I'm just going to abbreviate it, the eukaryotic cell has a nucleus. So the nucleus in this case is considered an organelle because it has its own membrane that separates that, what's inside that organelle from the rest of the cell. Okay, eukaryotic cells have a nucleus. They also are usually gonna be larger in size and more complex. So besides a nucleus, many times, most of the time, they have other organelles, and we'll talk about all the different types of organelles in just a little bit. But no matter whether it is a prokaryotic cell or a eukaryotic cell, there's four components that all cells have. And the first is genetic material. So this is a term to mean what, you've, what you inherit, right, from your parents. So DNA is genetic material, so you could use those interchangeably. The other thing that all cells have they have a plasma membrane. And this can also be called a cell membrane. That, that means the very same thing. But it is not the same thing as a cell wall. We'll talk about a cell wall later. A cell wall is, is in addition to a plasma membrane. And not all cells have a cell wall. So they're not the same thing. Ribosomes is another component of all cells. This is where proteins are produced in the cell. And lastly, all cells have to have cytoplasm, which is sort of like the liquidy, soupy part inside the cell. Now, I want you to know generally the structure of a prokaryotic cell. And um, the, the basic structure of a prokaryotic cell is, okay, there is a area in the cell where you find the DNA or the genetic material, but it is not in a nucleus, okay? It's just free inside the cell. You also are gonna have ribosomes that are free inside the cell, inside of the cytoplasm. And this blue ring here would be the plasma membrane, okay? That's around the cell. And prokaryotic cells have a cell wall on the outside of the plasma membrane. Now, a prokaryotic cell can have other features. So they can have a flagella. So this would be important for motility, a flagella that helps them to move. They can have something called pili that are all around the cell. Okay, that help with attachment, and they can actually even transfer information from one bacterial cell to the next through these pili. And so I just said bacteria when I was talking about a prokaryotic cell, and I want to make sure we understand that bacteria are a type of organism that, that have a prokaryotic cell. Um, there is another type of organism that has a prokaryotic cell, and those are called archaea. Okay, so these are both organisms 
that are made up of single prokaryotic cells. Now let's move forward. Again, for those of you that just joined in, if you have any questions, there's a little speech bubble thing that opens up a chat box at the bottom of the screen. And at any time, type in a question and I'll be happy to make sure I answer that. Let's start talking about organelles. Now, when we're mentioning organelles, this has to be for a eukaryotic cell because a prokaryotic cell does not have any membrane-bound organelles. So this is specific to the eukaryotic cell. What do I need to know about the plasma membrane? Well, it plays an important role in the cell. This says it regulates the passage of molecules and ions. Okay, You can think of this as the gatekeeper. This decides what gets into the cell and what gets out, and it doesn't allow the passage of everything. What is it made of? This is important right here. It's made of a phospholipid, so this is a type of fat. We'll talk about more about that when we talk about macromolecules. A phospholipid bilayer, meaning two layers. I'm going to show you in just a second a picture of these phospholipids. But what's important about a phospholipid is they have essentially two different chemical parts. They have a head, which is polar, and they have a tail, which is hydrophobic. So the tail is hydrophilic, or I mean, excuse me, the head is hydrophilic or water loving, and the tail is hydrophobic or water hating. And I want you to leave these blanks blank for just a second, and we're going to fill those in after I show you some phospholipids. So here is one individual phospholipid. Up here at the top, the circular part, this is the head. Okay, this is the hydrophilic head. It's the polar portion. And then these two little yellow portions down here, these are the hydrophobic tail. So this part down here is like oil, and this up here is like water. Okay, so chemically, it's very, the heads and the tails are very different. But this is one individual phospholipid. What I want us to look at now is how these phospholipids come together. Let me find the picture that I'm looking for. Here we go to form this bilayer that we're talking about it's, that makes up the plasma membrane. So this would be one phospholipid, right, head and tail. The way that they orient, this would be like one layer, okay, where they all line up head to head and tail to tail. And the reason is if you have ever put water and oil together, you know they don't like to be together. So the heads try to stick together. In a, in a row and the tails stick together. Well, in this other layer, the second layer that we see here, same thing. The heads line up together, the tails line up together. Now, if you imagine that this is the plasma membrane, okay, around a cell, so let's, let's imagine that the cell, which is usually circular, goes like this, right? There's the plasma membrane of the cell. So this would be inside the cell, and out here, this would be the outside, outside of the cell. And this plasma membrane is the division. So what that means is the hydrophilic heads, right, are both pointing to the interior most, right, into the cell, and the exterior most to the outside of the cell. And sandwiched in between is this big oil-like hydrophobic layer that makes up the interior of that plasma membrane. Now, why would they orient this way? Well, guess what most of the cell is inside? It's mostly water. And usually, guess what the extracellular matrix is out here outside the cell? It's usually mostly water. So the heads are oriented toward the water areas, and the tails stick in together. So now let's go back to our study guide and fill those in. So we have a phospholipid bilayer with polar heads pointing both out and in, right, to the outermost and the innermost. And then the hydrophobic tails are pointing toward the tail.
tails of the other layer. Okay, they're sandwiched in between the two heads. Now the fluid mosaic model is something that explains what's going on in the plasma membrane. So we, we looked at the phospholipids and the majority of the membrane is made of phospholipids. However, there are proteins that get sandwiched in there. There are sugars, cholesterol, other molecules that are, that are embedded in the phospholipid bilayer, but they're not stationary. So they're fluid, meaning they can move around in between those phospholipids. And the mosaic part, you've seen a mosaic tile table or something, means it's not a regular pattern. It doesn't go phospholipid, phospholipid, this kind of protein, phospholipid, phospholipid, cholesterol. It's not like that. It's a more mosaic pattern, not evenly distributed. Okay, so moving on, continuing on with um, the organelles, we have a nucleus. And you know what? I want to go back for a second and make sure that I did not... Uh, say something that was confusing to you okay i have here organelles right and I, I mentioned to you only eukaryotic cells have organelles because prokaryote cells don't but then i actually listed the plasma membrane because it is an organelle in the um eukaryotic cell but i, I don't want that to mislead you okay the plasma membrane is found in all cells so technically it goes up here so it's under my category of organelles, but just make a note that it's not really an uh, organelle. It's really just a part of the cell. Nucleus, however, is a true organelle. It's got a membrane around it. What is its whole purpose? Its whole purpose is it houses the genetic material. Okay, It keeps it separate from all the goings on of the rest of the cell. It packages up, keeps it protected. Now, I do want to talk about chromatin and chromosomes, okay? And we will learn more about that as we go through the semester. But I want you to understand that both of these, chromatin, chromatin and chromosomes, this is just, okay, the form of DNA, how the DNA is currently existing. And it, ha it has to do with how tightly is the DNA actually packaged in the nucleus? So we'll learn the difference between chromatin and chromosomes as we move on to cell division. But for now, I want you to know that both of those refer to DNA in the cell. We already know that ribosomes, which are not organelles because all cells have them, um, are where the protein is produced. The nucleolus is not the same as the nucleus. And I'll show you on the cell in a minute. It's a it's a interior portion of the nucleus where the RNA is produced. The nuclear envelope is the membrane right around the nucleus. That's what separates what's inside the nucleus from what's outside. And then there are tiny pores or holes in the nuclear envelope. And this is what allows certain molecules into the nucleus and out of the nucleus. Now let's move on and talk about the endoplasmic reticulum. There are two types of endoplasmic reticulum. There's the rough ER and there's the smooth ER and they're two different organelles. They have different structures and different functions. And the reason that we call the rough ER rough is because it contains lots of ribosomes. Okay, so when you look at it through the microscope, when it's stained, it's, it's got, it looks like Braille almost because these little ribosomes are studded all over it, and that's how it got its name. So since we know that ribosomes are where proteins are produced, then that tells us if the rough ER is filled with ribosomes, then what's going on in the rough ER is it's making proteins. Proteins are being made there. Now, what happens to these proteins? They get packaged up by a little piece of the rough ER membrane that wraps around these proteins and it ships them off. And it ships them to another um, organelle called the Golgi apparatus or the Golgi body. Hold on to that for just a second. We'll move to the smooth ER. The smooth ER's job is to make lipids, okay? And it will also 
package these lipids up in what's called a vesicle, which, mean, which just means a little piece of its membrane pinches off and holds these lipids and carries it to the Golgi, just like the rough ER sends the proteins to Golgi, which leads us to the Golgi. Okay, what is its built? It receives these vesicles right, that are sent from a smooth and rough ER. So it's receiving proteins from the rough ER. It's receiving lipids from the smooth ER. And some kind of modification is made in the Golgi. So it's altering them in some way. And it repackages them and, and has a signal. So they, they are destined either to another location in the cell or they're destined to go all the way out and fuse with the plasma membrane and then to be released outside of the cell. So you can think of the Golgi as like a receiving and shipping dock. It receives these vesicles. It makes a change to the protein or the lipid, and then it ships it back off okay, to wherever it's destined in the cell. Um, now, I want to talk about lysosomes. Okay, They're listed here, and I just want to make sure you make the connection. Lysosomes are a vesicle that's made by the Golgi. Their special job is to digest or break down old, worn out molecules or organelles. So it's like a great big recycling center. But these digestive enzymes that are inside of the lysosome would be harmful if they were out in the cytoplasm of the cell. So they're kept inside of a membrane so that it doesn't harm the other parts of the cell. Okay, so right here, we're gonna put digestive enzymes, okay? And we'll talk about this a little bit later, but I want to make sure that you make the connection. What is an enzyme? It is a type of protein. Oops, okay. So these are proteins that are breaking down old, worn out cell parts. Moving on in our list of organelles, the centrosome is an organelle that, that has a pair of what are called centrioles. And these are not found in plant cells. These are only found in animal cells. And at this point, what you need to know is the centrosome plays a role in cell division. When the cell gets ready to copy everything and divide into two, the centrosome, excuse me, it plays a role in that. Now the chloroplast and the mitochondria, we call energy organelles because they have something to do with the energy processing of a cell. And another couple of interesting facts about the mitochondria and the chloroplast is that they not only have one membrane, they have double membranes around these organelles. And they actually also both have their own DNA that they carry with them. The mitochondria is found in both animal and plant cells. It's the powerhouse of the cell because it produces this molecule called ATP, and again, we'll learn more and more about this throughout the semester. But ATP, what do you need to know about it right now? Okay, it's the energy currency of the cell. Okay, what does that mean? Well, dollars are our currency, right? If I want to drive somewhere, I have to pay money for my gasoline. If I want some, if I want to buy clothes, if I want to buy any currency. Well, the cell, if it wants to move a molecule, if it wants to contract, you know, it's a muscle cell that wants to contract any work the cell wants to do, it has to use currency, and the way that it does that is with this molecule ATP. And the ATP is made in this organelle called the mitochondria, and it's made from the food that we eat, okay? So mitochondria, plant and animal cells. The chloroplast, on the other hand, okay, this is not found in animal cells. These are found in only plant cells. Well, between animal and plant, they're only found in plant, right? There, there are algae that also have chloroplast and some bacteria. But for, between the animal and plant cell models, plant only. This is the site of photosynthesis. We'll talk about photosynthesis later, too. But for now, what you need to know is that's how plants convert sunlight into chemical energy. So the chloroplast is the organelle that's in charge of that. Um, 
couple more cytoskeleton. So this is what is providing support. These are anchoring the organelles in the cell. They can move uh, molecules around in the cell or organelles. And there's three types of cytoskeleton. Um, microtubules, which are the largest, intermediate filaments, medium size, and actin or microfilaments, which are the smallest size. All right, the cell wall is our last organelle. The cell wall is not found in animal cells, okay? It's found in plant cells. Remember when we talked about prokaryotes a minute ago, we also said that bacteria, prokaryotic cells, have a cell wall outside of their plasma membrane. Now the cell wall of a plant cell is not the, the same chemical makeup as the cell wall of a bacterial cell. Plant cells have a cell wall made of cellulose, whereas bacteria have a cell wall made of something called peptidoglycan. What is the job of the cell wall? It is a more rigid structure than the plasma membrane. It provides protection and support for the plant cell. Now let's just review as we look at actual animal and plant cells, which cells have which organelles. Okay, so here's our plant cell. Let's just identify these. So we're gonna start where the DNA is stored. Okay, right here is the nucleus. And remember that that houses the DNA or the genetic material. And you can see kind of this thread-like looking stuff throughout the nucleus, that's the DNA. This darker circle in, in interior to the nucleus, this is the nucleolus, okay? And this is where the RNA is produced. Now, as we move out from the nucleus, this stuff that just sort of has these folded membranes with the red dots all around it. That's the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And the dots that you see are those ribosomes. So remember that this is the site of protein production. Okay, the rough ER. Now, I also want to make sure that you see that there are free ribosomes. Okay, all the red dots that are out here in the cytoplasm. Those are also free ribosomes. So there are ribosomes free in the cytoplasm besides all of those that are on the rough ER. The smooth ER is this portion here. And this is, remember, the site of lipid production. And those proteins and lipids, when they're produced, get shipped to the Golgi apparatus, which is here. The Golgi is the receiving and shipping dock that alters those proteins or lipids and then packages them up to wherever their destination is, either in or outside of the cell. Working our way around, we have the mitochondria and notice that there is, there's just one nucleus, right? Just one rough ER, just one smooth ER, just one Golgi, but there's more than one mitochondria shown in this cell and it depends on the cell type. So some cells have more mitochondria than other. It depends on the energy requirement. So your muscle cells that you use a lot, they're going to have lots of mitochondria because you need lots of energy currency in those cells. So the mitochondria, we're going to say powerhouse. Job is to make ATP, which is the energy currency. Okay, again, we have more than one chloroplast. Okay, this is where photosynthesis occurs. All of these colorations, right, none of these are real except for the chloroplast. They really are green. That's what makes plant leaves look green to you is the green pigments in the chloroplast. Okay, the cytoplasm, that's the cell soup, right, that all the organelles are in. We've already talked about the plasma membrane is the gatekeeper. The cell wall is outside of the plasma membrane, okay. Animal cells do not have a cell wall. So this is a plant cell, has a cell wall. Um, central vacuole is an organelle that is not found in animal cells. It's found in a plant cell. And as you can see here, it fills with water. 
okay? And <clears throat> part of the job of, of the central vacuole, which actually you'll see the week after the test, is it fills with water, which presses out against the cytoplasm, which presses out against the cell wall, and that's what helps your plants stand up and be um, not be wilted -y. Okay, the, the, the central vacuole. All right, cytoskeleton, you can see various um, microtubules, intermediate filaments, active filaments throughout the cell. Um, let's see, okay, plasmodesmata. This is one of the last things on our study guide. I'm gonna go ahead and point it out to you. Plasmodesmata are essentially like little channels that connect one plant cell to the next. So if there was another, let me erase this. If there was another plant cell, okay, right next to this one, okay, a plasma desmata would be like an opening in the cell wall of those two plants where they could communicate so they could share cytoplasm and they could send signaling molecules back and forth. It's a way that they can communicate to their neighboring cell. Let's look at the animal cell real quickly. So I'm not going to go over all the organelles that we just went over in the plant cell because there, there's many right that they that they share. But there's a few that are different that that the animal cell has that the plant cell doesn't have. And let's talk about those. So the first is the centrosome with a pair of centrioles. Remember that's the one that's involved in cell division for the animal cell. Um, the lysosomes here with those digestive enzymes that break down old cell parts, okay? Um, and so you see nucleus, nucleolus, rough ER, smooth ER, Golgi, um, mitochondria, all of the cytoskeleton, plasma membrane, ribosomes, all of that good stuff. So where are we? We're almost done with this study guide. So we talked about the plasma desmata, the, the little channels where plant cells can communicate directly with one another and the cytoplasm can sort of be shared between the two and, and signaling. Now let's talk about what do I mean by extracellular matrix? Okay, well, animal cells produce and secrete outside of their plasma membrane proteins and other substances that they're growing in, and that's called the extracellular matrix. So I'm just going to put here, um, say, proteins and other molecules, right? One that you'll recognize is specifically collagen. A lot of the extracellular matrix is made up of collagen. And this is the, the outside area where the animal cells are growing in. It's produced by those cells. Now, animal cells also have junctions that hold more than one cell together. And let's talk for just a second about the importance of these junctions. So the first one listed here is the gap junction, okay? These essentially form a pore or a channel, a connection between two cells. So you sometimes they will refer to it as a donut hole. I'll show you a picture in just a second, okay? And what would be the point of connecting animal cells this way? Well, one, whoops, that, <laughs> it's hard to talk and write something different at the same time. Electrical signals, okay, can quickly spread through these pores from one cell to the next. And so one area, an example of an area that you would see this is in the heart, in the cardiac muscle cells of the heart. So that's the gap junction. And let's talk about the tight junction. Okay, these are a water, they form, it's like almost like zipping up, right, cells. They form a watertight seal, whoops, okay. Epithelial cells or epithelial tissue is a, a type of tissue that you find these. So you find this type of tissue in your skin and you also find this type of tissue in the lining of your organs, of your internal organs. So we don't want leaking, right? 
So we want a tight seal between those two. Now, I have written here adhesion, okay, junction. I want to talk specifically about a really important adhesion type junction called a desmosome. Okay, whoops. This you can think of as a strong weld, okay, holding cells together. When they stretch, okay, tissues that are going to be stretched, this is going to hold those tissues together. So same thing in, the, in your skin, in the lining of your organs. You also need, besides just a watertight seal, you also need welds that hold those tissues together. So let's have a look at these. Here we go. All right, so here, here's a figure that shows several of these junctions. So um, let's see, gap junctions right here. And so if you look through the other side, in other words, there's a hole or a pore right in the middle of those, okay? And so you can have signals that are shared between those two cells, okay? Now, um, the tight junctions, where, where I mentioned it like, looks like a little zipper, which seals it up so that you don't have leakage across those cells. And then the desmosomes right here, okay? Remember, these are just going to be like welding, gluing these together so that as they stretch, um, they, they hold them together. All right, I believe that that's all I've got for study out four. So you let me know if there's something that you'd like me to cover before I move on. Let me know. Okay, so I'm going to start back with lesson one and we'll go in order from there. So study guide one, biology is a study of, I'm going to change my color here, life. And one of the first things in lesson one we talked about was the scientific method. And there's several steps. The first of all, you have to make an observation. So for example, the power goes out or I need to go outside in the dark and I need a flashlight. So I go to turn my flashlight on and it, it doesn't come on. So my observation is my flashlight, the light's not coming on. Okay. So at that point, I am going to propose a hypothesis. Now, it's important that this is testable, meaning you can prove it to be wrong, right? There's a way to test to see if this is incorrect. So I might propose a hypothesis. If I change the batteries in this flashlight, then it will, the light will come on. So it is testable, right? Because I can put the batteries in if I have batteries and see if, in fact, it doesn't come on. If it doesn't, then I've proven my hypothesis to be false. So I would conduct an experiment, which would consist of me changing out the batteries. I would collect my data. Does it turn on or not? And then I would draw conclusions. So let's say that it does not turn on. What conclusions might I draw? Well, I've proven my hypothesis correct, incorrect. So I might go back and say, I need to propose another hypothesis. Maybe it needs a new bulb, right? If I change the bulb, then the light will come on. But let's say that, in fact, it does. The light does come on when I change the batteries. Okay? Does that mean that every time a flashlight doesn't work, you change the batteries and it will come on? No, it doesn't. So just because I haven't disproven my hypothesis does not make it a theory. A theory is something that has been tested over and over and over and has not been able to be disproven. So there's a, a wealth of scientific evidence that supports that theory. Now, I want to specifically talk about different types of variables for scientific exper experiments. So independent and dependent variables. Let's talk about those first. The independent variable is the variable that I am changing as a scientist or in the experiment, the, the one that's being manipulated or changed. Okay. So in this case, the batteries would be my independent variable. Okay change the batteries. The dependent variable 
depends on the independent variable. So the dependent variable is, does the light come on or not? That's the dependent variable. Now, if I were going to do a real scientific study, right, I would have to have many flashlights and many trials. And, and if I did that, I would want to have some control. I, I wouldn't want just a lot of different variables. So, for example, I might not want all different brands of flashlights or different ages of flashlights. I would want to keep some of, excuse me, some of that constant. Now, let, let's talk about another example of um, scientific method. Let's say that I'm going to test different laundry detergents to see is it worth it to pay extra for, you know, some name brand Tide versus another brand. Or maybe I want to compare Tide liquid to Tide powder to Tide pods or something. Okay. Well, let's say that I'm testing several different brands to see which one, if, if one is better than the other. My independent variable then is going to be the brand. So Tide versus All versus Cheer versus, you know, the Walmart brand. Equate. Then my dependent variable would be what depends on the independent variable. So let's say that I'm going to use grass stains. Okay. I want to know which detergent does better with taking out grass stains. So the de dependent variable would be how much grass stain is left after I've washed it with a particular detergent. Now, there would be lots of control variables that would, you would want to keep constant, right? That you didn't want to in interfere with, with the differences in grass stains. So, for example, I want to use the same type of washer. I want to use the same cycle. I want to use the same temperature water. I want to use the same amount of time that it washes. Same initial amount of grass stain, all of those things you want controlled across your study. All right, let's move to characteristics of living things. So your book provides sev several examples of characteristics that all living things share. So let's go over these together. So the first one that we have listed here is order, all right? All living things are gonna have a certain amount of order, for example, Cells that have organelles, okay, the organelles work together. They each have a special function, right, to keep the cell healthy and, fun and, and doing its job. You could say the same thing for actual organs in, in a human body, right? The, our organs form organ systems, and our organ systems all have special functions that they carry out. To make sure that everything works like it should in the cell. I mean, excuse me, in the body. All right. Next one. Responding to stimuli. Okay. So this can be as simple as, um, you know, you uh, go outside and it's extremely cold. And so you go inside and put a coat on. Okay. Or a plant, it grows toward the sunlight. Okay. Um, simple organisms, their movement toward a food source or away from something harmful. Those are all examples of responding to stimuli. Reproduction. Okay, we know what that is. And it can either be asexual reproduction. So, for example, a bacterial cell that makes a copy of everything and just divides in two. Or it can be as complicated as sexual reproduction for animals or plants. Okay, number four, we have growth and development. And the, the way that organisms grow and develop is specifically um, instructed for by your genes in your DNA, or the bacteria's genes, or the plant's genes. And then we have, um, so I have regulation slash regulation. I guess I really wanted you to understand that there is regulation. Example of regulation in a living system would be the blood flow throughout your body or the way that you absorb nutrients or, and transport them, okay, so that your blood sugar doesn't get too high or it doesn't get too low. Homeostasis is very related to regulation. So if you think of... Um, you want this sort of constant 
internal condition, right? You don't want a huge fluctuation. So body temperature would be an example. You want your body temperature to stay in a, in a certain range. Your blood pH stays in a certain range. All right, energy processing. All cells need energy to survive. Remember, we, we know now that energy is in the form of ATP. Without energy, the cell dies. So every organism has to have a way that it takes in energy, whether that's ingesting food or using sunlight to produce food. All organisms have to have a way to have energy. All right, so here, when an animal uses senses to smell or hear a predator and therefore hides or runs, this would be an example of response to stimuli. Now, we know that order or organization is one of the levels, one of the characteristics of living things, so let's go through the levels of biological organization. Okay, I want to point out to you something first. Um, atoms, right, are very small, smallest unit of matter, but they're not living. Atoms form molecules, and molecules form macromolecules, and we're going to talk later tonight about the four macromolecules. Macromolecules form organelles, but none of these are living yet, right? These are still just molecules. The smallest unit of life is the cell. We talked about that already. And then, if we go from simplest to most complex, we say, all right, smallest living thing is the cell. After that, if cells come together, they can form tissue. You can have multiple tissues form an organ. Multiple organs form an organ system, um, which then together can form an organism. At this point, multiple organisms coming together form a population. More than one population forms a community and ecosystem, and finally, biosphere. Now let's talk for just a second about population, community, and ecosystem and biosphere. So if, if, let's, let's say um, light grapevine. There, there are lots of different populations at Lake Grapevine. So, for example, one population might be all of the, I don't know what kind of fish, bass, okay, that are in Lake Grapevine. If there's ever trout, all of the trout. Each species is its own population at Lake Grapevine. The community, however, is all the population. So that's all the birds, all the flowers, all the grass all the fish, all the algae, right? Every, bacteria, everything living makes up the community. The ecosystem then is the whole community, all the living things, but you have to add in the non-living things or abiotic, okay, not living, which means water, dirt, rocks, air, all of that makes up the ecosystem. The biosphere just means the whole entire livable ecosystem or where life exists on Earth, and that's the biosphere. So now we've, we've described all of these. Let's talk about the three domains. So RK is one. They're made up of prokaryotic cells, which means no nucleus. Bacteria is another. Again, made of prokaryotic cells, no nucleus. Eukarya, eukarya, excuse me, made up of eukaryotic cells, have a nucleus. All right, now, these are different areas within biology. So let's just talk for just a second. Molecular biology or biochemistry, molecular meaning at the molecule level, right, at the molecular level. So we're talking about scientists or fields that study DNA. They study protein, proteins. A lot of people do research about pharmaceuticals, about how, how your gene, what genes code for, 
lots of different things like that within the cell. Microbiology studies microorganisms, okay? So bacteria, um, even archaea. There's a lot of different divisions within microbiology, but we're thankful to microbiologists so that when we're sick and we have to get a culture, they can tell us what it is, what kind of nasty germ we have. Okay, forensic science uses science to answer questions, right? Legal questions. This is, this is, so I'm a biochemist, but this is where my experience is in DNA testing and forensic science. Neurobiology is the nervous system. We think of it with the brain. Paleontology, fossils, right? We think about that with dinosaurs. Zoology, animals, and botany. Okay, so remember, if you've got any questions, feel free to type them in there. I will answer them, promise. Let's move on to lesson two. We have the, the chemistry portion of it is in is in lesson two. So first of all, there are four elements that are the most common in living things, and they are, okay, I remember them like this, chon, okay, so carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. <clears throat> we say something is organic because it contains carbon, okay? At least in science, that's what it means. Doesn't mean it was grown a special way when you go to the grocery store and you pay more for organic vegetables, okay? By the term that we call organic, everything in there would be organic, right? Because it all contains carbon. All right, element, let's talk about what these are, okay? An element, when you look at the periodic table, every single square on that periodic table is a different element. So they all have unique, properties. All matter, every piece of matter on this earth is made up of some combination of all of those elements. An atom just means when you can take an element and you get it down to the smallest piece of that element and then you just can't get any smaller, that's an atom. It's the smallest piece when it's still that element. Matter, the technical definition, anything that, that has mass and takes up space. Okay. And then we have um, atomic symbol. I'm going to show you that with periodic table in just a second. Um, the mass number, protons, neutrons, electrons. Protons, neutrons, and electrons are all what we call subatomic particles. So these are the particles that are found within atoms. We'll talk about that. I'm also going to explain to you what the atomic number is. And we'll go from there. So hold on one second while I pull out the periodic table. Okay, so hopefully, this may be a little delayed, but hopefully now you're, you're seeing the periodic table of elements. So each one of these is an element. And I just want to point out to you a few things about the periodic table, and then we'll go back and, and look at it on the screen a little bit better. But, for example, we're going to look at carbon, which is right here. Okay, and I want you to notice that there's a few things about carbon. So it has a little six. Uh, at the top of the box, and then at the bottom it says 12.0107, and it has a symbol with a capital C, okay, um, and so we're going to talk about what each of those numbers means. All right, so here's our little box. 
from the periodic table that has, that's the box for carbon. So it has a little number here, six, and it has 12 point something down here, okay? Now this obviously is the atomic symbol and every, every element either has one capital letter or a capital letter, lowercase letter. Most of the time they seem to make sense, right? C for carbon, but every once in a while there's one that doesn't, like sodium is Na, and that's because of the Latin name for sodium. Now, the number that's typically at the top that goes in numerical order across the periodic table is the atomic number. The number down here that's a larger number is the atomic mass. Now, if we think about an atom, so for example, an atom of carbon, um, there are three different subatomic particles that are found in every atom. Protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons have a positive charge. Electrons have a negative charge. And neutrons are neutral. Okay, they have no charge. And I don't know if I told you the joke. The neutron walked into the bar and asked the bartender how much for a beer. And the bartender said, for you, no charge. Okay, so there's these particles. Now, how do I know how many? Because I want you to be able to identify how many um, protons, electrons, and neutrons are in any particular atom of an element. And this is how you do that. The atomic number always tells you the number of protons in an atom of that element. Always. So there are six protons in every atom of carbon. It will not be carbon if there's five. If there's five, then it's another element. Okay. If there's seven, it's another element. All atoms of carbon have six protons. Now, for an electrically neutral atom, like what, what we will work with from, from the periodic table, when you look something up at the periodic table and it's an atom of that element, it is electrically neutral. So that means that it will have equal number of protons and electrons. So the, if the atomic number tells you how many protons, that's telling you that's equal to the number of electrons. So in this case, carbon has six protons, carbon has six electrons. Now how do we find out how many neutrons? Well, that has to do with the atomic mass. The atomic mass takes into account the protons plus the neutrons. So when we round that number to the nearest whole number, so we're saying protons plus neutrons equals 12. Well, if there's six protons, what do I have to add to six to get 12? Well, there must be 12 neutrons. So in the case of carbon, it's six of everything. How is it arranged um, in the atom? Well, the atom has something we call the nucleus, which is not the same thing as the nucleus of the cell, right? When we say nucleus of the atom, what we mean is the very central core of the atom. So in the core of the atom, we're going to have six, let me draw them here, protons, okay? Six plus charges. We're also going to have six neutrons. And then we have six electrons, but the electrons are not in the nucleus of the atom. They are actually circling. So I'm going to draw an electron here. Okay, I'm going to show it circling. Okay, I'm going to draw an electron here. They are in energy shells of the atom. So there's actually two electrons in the first energy shell and up to eight in the next energy shell. But we only have a total of six, so I put two in the first shell which leaves me four to go in the second shell. The electrons are in constant motion, so they're not stationary. They're constantly moving around the atom. Let's go back for just a second to our review sheet. And fill some of this in. So we left off with the number of protons is equal to the atomic number. 
The atomic mass, or sometimes called the mass number, includes protons and neutrons together. Now, moving along, the part of the atom that participates in bonding is the electron, okay? Atoms are going to either give or take or share electrons in order to do one thing, and that is to fill what's called its valence shell. So remember when I drew the atom and I said we can put two electrons in this first shell and we can put four electrons in the second shell? All atoms desire to have their valence shell filled. The first shell is full with two, but after that, it's full with eight, okay, or more as we go out, but we won't worry about that, two or eight. Um, and so an atom is either going to share or give or take electrons in order to have a full valence shell. If an atom gains an electron or takes an electron, remember electrons are negatively charged. So if it takes an electron, it's taking a negative. It's like it's taking on a debt. Okay, so it will have an, a charge of minus, right, minus one if it takes one electron. This charge is actually called an ion, okay? When an atom has more or less electrons than protons, in other words, when the pluses and the minuses aren't even, that creates either a positive charge or a negative charge, and what, that is an ion, okay, a charged particle. So when it creates an ion like this, what that does is it produces an ionic bond. So just like we say opposites attract, one ion that's positively charged will be attracted to an ion that's negatively charged, and that is, in fact, an ionic bond. Okay, a covalent bond, on the other hand, have I skipped this somewhere? Okay. Here we go. Okay, so we talked about an ionic bond here. Okay, an ionic bond is where an atom is going to take or give electrons. And when it does that, you have an imbalance, right? You have more pluses than minuses and vice versa. That is what forming the ions means. A covalent bond, on the other hand, is when atoms are going to share electrons. Okay, this is the strongest bond, the sharing of electrons. Now I just want us to go back to the whiteboard for just a second. And if you have a periodic table, I'm just going to give you this information, but you can look it up on your periodic table, okay? And um, I'm looking up sodium has an atomic number of 11 and chlorine has an atomic number of 17. So what we're going to look at is, oops, we're going to look at sodium and we're going to look at chlorine. Okay, sodium has an atomic number of 11 which means it has 11 protons and since it's electrically neutral element, that means it has 11 electrons. So I'm going to draw my electron shells, okay, and so the first shell for any atom is full with two. So I'll put my two electrons in there. And I'm going to draw my next shell, which is full with eight, so I can go ahead and put eight electrons there. But that's only 10 total electrons, which means sodium has 11, so I need to put one more shell out here with one lone electron. So here's the thing. Sodium's not happy. It wants a full valence shell. But what do you think is more likely? The sodium's going to gain seven more electrons so that it will have a full valence or that it might just give up one electron. If it does that, right, then the valence shell becomes this one that's full with eight. So if it can give up one electron, got a full valence and it's happy. So sodium will do just that. It will give up one electron. Now sodium, has, it still has 11 protons, right? So it still has 11 pluses, but it 
it's given up an electron, so it only has 10 electrons or 10 minuses. So 11 minus 10 means that it's got a charge of plus one. So we would say sodium is now an ion and it has a charge of one positive charge. Now let's do the th same thing for chlorine. Chlorine has 17 electrons. So two go in the first shell. One, two, okay. Eight go in the second shell. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's 10. We have seven more. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Chlorine is not happy. It needs one more electron to have a completely full valence. So guess what? This electron that sodium gave up, chlorine will take this electron, okay? And now it has a happy valence. However, chlorine still has 17 protons, but now since it gained an electron, it has 18 minuses. So 17 minus 18 means it's got a charge of minus one. So we would write that like this. Minus. But what happens is these two are attracted, opposites attract, and so we get sodium chloride, which is just an ionic bond formed between two oppositely charged ions. So that's ionic bonding. Now let's do the same thing for covalent bonding. Let's use water. Oxygen, okay. So again, you're, you can look it up on your periodic charter. I'm just gonna tell you that oxygen has an atomic number of eight. Okay. So first shell is full with two. And the second shell has six. Now I'm going to draw these in a certain way because I know what's going to happen. Okay, I'm going to put four here. I'm going to put one here and one here. So oxygen needs two more electrons in order to have a full valence. Well, what's going to happen is we have a hydrogen here and we have a hydrogen here, they each have an atomic number of one, which means they have one proton and one electron, okay? So hydrogen has one, well, they're going to share a pair of electrons here and they're going to share a pair of electrons here. And when they share, they, they both get to count both of them. So oxygen gets to count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, it has a full valence. Hydrogen gets to count one, two, and remember in the first shell, the valence is full with two. So these are covalent bonds in that they're shared. Now before we go back to the notes, I wanna point something out to you, and that is that there is something called electronegativity. And this is an atom's attraction for its electrons or for electrons. So this is how tightly an atom is going to hold on to electrons. And, and the values are very different for oxygen and hydrogen. Oxygen is very electronegative. It's going to hold those electrons toward it more of the time, whereas hydrogen is not as electronegative. It's not going to hold on to them as much. So even though this is a covalent bond, if they're being shared, they're not being shared equally. So these, in reality, these electrons are going to spend more time around oxygen, okay, which overall, if you look at the overall molecule, let's say here's the molecule, it's going to be what we call slightly negatively charged up here because that's where the electrons spend more of their time. And down here on this end, it's going to be partially or slightly positively charged. It's going to be important later when we talk about water and when we talk about hydrogen bonding of water. Oops. Okay, so let's go to page two. There we go. So we've already answered this question. Why are some covalent bonds polar and some nonpolar? It has to do with the electronegativity of the atoms. So if they have similar electronegativity, they're going to share equal. 
and they're bonded nonpolar, there's not a partial charge. But if their electronegativity values are very different, or if they don't share equally, then they're going to have polar bonds. Okay. What is a hydrogen bond? A hydrogen bond is going to occur. It's a very weak bond. They're, they're made and broken all the time. And it, it occurs between already bonded molecules. Okay, so it, it takes a hydrogen atom that's already bonded to something that's very electronegative like oxygen. So we're, this is hydrogen bonding that you see in water. So for example, each one of these red and white molecules is a water molecule. So the red represents oxygen and the white represents hydrogen. So this is one water molecule. These dashed lines represent the hydrogen bond between one mo water molecule and another. So notice it's the hydrogen from one water molecule that's bonded to an oxygen, right? That is hydrogen bonding to an oxygen, uh, yes, an oxygen atom in another water molecule. Okay, so you see that all of these dashed lines show all of the hydrogen bonding that's occurring within these water molecules. In water, in liquid water, these bonds would be made and broken regularly as the water molecules are moving. Same thing in, in a water vapor, there would be hardly any hydrogen bonds because they're moving so rapidly. But in ice, in solid water, as the temperature lowers, the movement of the molecules slow down, and every single water molecule is making hydrogen bonds with four other water molecules. And that is what makes ice actually less dense than water, because in order for those water molecules to have those four hydrogen bonds occurring, it actually spreads them out further apart than they are in liquid water, which means there's more empty space, which means it's lighter or less dense. So you can see, by sort of this lattice looking structure that, that it forms, there's a lot of empty space, right? So this is ice, this is what ice would look like. In liquid water, these would be being made and broken all the time and they would fit into a much smaller space and therefore it would be more dense. Okay, so hydrogen bonding is such an important property in water, it actually gives us these properties that we're going to talk about that are very important for all living things. And so first of all, water is an excellent solvent. It dissolves polar things, ionic things. Number two here we want to talk about is cohesion. Let me change my color. Okay. Water has cohesion. Okay. Cohesion means water's ability to stick to other water molecules. Adhesion is water's ability to stick to other types of molecules. And it is cohesion and adhesion that allows water to be drawn up from the roots of plants up the stem out to all the leaves. Okay. So if you imagine if you, if you take a piece of paper or, or a Kleenex and you put the very corner of it down into a glass of water and you leave it there, after a while, water's going to be drawn up, right? It's going to soak that piece of paper or soak that Kleenex because of these properties of cohesion and adhesion. So I mentioned to you ice or solid water is less dense than liquid water. You know that because when you put ice in a glass, it floats, okay? But why is this important to life? Well, if you think about a pond or a lake in places where it gets very cold, and, in, and it stays below freezing for a period of time, you have ice form, right? But what happens is the ice forms a layer over the top of that lake or pond, which essentially is an insulator for all the life underneath there. Well, if, if ice froze and then was more dense and sank to the bottom, it would freeze the pond all the way up and all of the living things would die. But because it floats, it forms that insulated layer and the frogs and fish and everything can, can live underneath that layer through the layer. Okay, high surface tension. So this is something that if you, if you think about a pond that's kind of still when it's not a really windy day, leaves or debris or little insects actually float on the surface of the water, right? They don't all sink to the bottom. So for, for organisms that lay eggs on the surface of the water, 
this is important and also so that debris doesn't just build up right it floats and then is carried to the bank of the water high heat capacity we are you know 75 or so percent water and so this helps us to maintain our body temperature we re our water resist changes in in heat um, water is polar yes and that is um, part of what gives hydrogen bonding um, its properties, right? If, if it wasn't for the polarity of water, we wouldn't have hydrogen bonding. We wouldn't have all of these properties. Um, we call things that can dissolve in water hydrophilic, okay, which means water loving. Things that do not dissolve in water, like oil, we call hydrophobic or water fear. Okay, so let's talk about solutions, just some terminology. There is solvent and there is solute in a solution. The solvent is what it is being dissolved in. And so there are other solvents than water, but most of what we will talk about, water is the solvent. Therefore, the solute is what is being dissolved. So if it's a sodium chloride or saline solution, the solute would be sodium chloride. What is an acid and what is a base? So an acid okay, lowers the pH below 7. And a base has a pH above 7. Okay. Um, the, the way that this works chemically, there is an ion called a hydrogen ion. And acids release these or make, they increase these, whereas bases reduce these. So an increase in the concentration or amount of hydrogen ion lowers the pH, which means makes it more acidic. A decrease in the concentration or amount of H plus raises the pH, okay, or makes it more basic. And so let's, let's talk for just a second about the pH scale and what that means. Um, and you, you had a little bit of experience with this with the, with the first lab. So let's say that we have a pH scale here, okay? Zero here, 14, okay? Right in the middle is seven which is neutral. Everything below seven is an acid. Everything above seven is a base. Okay. The closer, the lower the number, the stronger the acid. Uh, the higher the number, the stronger the base. So that would mean hydrogen ion concentration would increase right as you go down so hydrogen ion increases as you go lower um, there is another ion which is the OH minus or hydroxide ion that increases as the number gets larger so in other words the stronger the base the more hydroxide ion the stronger the acid, the more or higher concentration of hydrogen ion. Lastly, on this review sheet, the last blank is our body. In our body, we have buffers that regulate the pH of our blood. We don't want big increases or decreases in the pH of our blood. That wouldn't be healthy. So we have chemicals called buffers that help us to maintain a somewhat constant pH in our blood. All right, let's go to lesson three, biological molecules. And we've talked about some of these terms already, organic, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, but there's some new ones. So for example, we wanna make sure we explain what a monomer and what a polymer is um, when we're talking about macromolecules. So I'll, I'll do that in just a second. Um, Carbon is the building block, right, of the macromolecules of our cells. 
it's it's very versatile. So uh, my younger son used to like to build with all kinds of things. So carbon is like the ultimate building block because it forms four bonds. It can branch. It can make a straight chain. It can make a ring. It can make single bonds. It can make double bonds. So it's very versatile atom. Now, I'm going to skip over here for just a second and say we have four macromolecules or biological molecules of the cell. Macro meaning large. What are they? Okay, They're carbohydrates, nucleic acids, proteins, and lipids. These are the four macromolecules. What do you need to know about these? Well, they are large molecules or polymers, but they're made up of individual building blocks or monomers. So each one of these four is going to have a monomer, a building block, and when you put a bunch of those monomers together, you're going to get this large polymer or macromolecule. So I want to talk about the monomers and polymers of each one. Okay, the monomer of a carbohydrate is a monosaccharide, okay, which is a fancy word for a single sugar molecule. The polymer, I'm running out of room here, it, for a carbohydrate is called a polysaccharide. So that just means many of these individual sugars bonded together. Now, each of these, the lipid category we'll talk about last because it's a little bit different, but each of these has a specific monomer. The monomers are bonded together to form a polymer, and it happens by way of a dehydration reaction, which means you're building up this big polymer by losing water. Okay, I'm going to show you what I mean by this in a second. That's why it's called dehydration. The opposite can also occur. You can take your big macromolecule or your big polymer, and it can be broken down into its individual monomers by the opposite type of reaction called hydrolysis, which means you're having to put water in to break these bonds. Okay, so the polymer is created by the dehydration reaction, and the monomer, it's broken down into the monomers by a hydrolysis reaction. So I want to show you how that works real quick. Okay, first up is the dehydration reaction. This ring that you see here, this looks like a hexagon with some atoms coming off of it. That is one monosaccharide. That's a single sugar. This is also a monosaccharide or a single sugar. Notice it says this plus this, but in other words, these are individual single sugar, single monosaccharides. The dehydration reaction happens, this arrow means that's what's going to happen if the dehydration reaction occurs. And notice what's different on the right side of the arrow is we have a bond now. We have a new bond. In other words, these two monosaccharides are now bonded together. So there's two sugars, which means they're called a di, di means two in Latin, disaccharide. Okay. If you repeat this over and over and over and over and over, then you'll have hundreds uh, sugars bonded together or thousands and eventually you have your polysaccharide with many many sugars bonded together. It's called dehydration because as you see shown in red this would be H2O right is water. This is where the water molecule is lost from so that there will be a direct bond between these two. Okay so here's your lost water molecule. So that's the dehydration reaction. It's shown here for sugars, for, for the carbohydrate version, but the reaction works the same way for proteins, um, for nucleic acids, and for certain a certain type of lipid that we'll talk about. So a new bond is formed by losing water. Okay, let's talk about nucleic acids. The monomer for a nucleic acid is a nucleotide, and the polymer is DNA or RNA. For proteins, the monomer is an amino acid in which there are 20 different types, 
And the polymer is a polypeptide or a protein. Now there are more than one type of lipid. One of them we've already talked about the phospholipid, which we said is really important in membranes. It forms a bilayer. I'm gonna in a minute show you some interesting things about fats. And waxes are another type of lipid and also steroids, which we'll look at in just a minute. <clears throat> so I do want you to recognize, you know, a monosaccharide, that, that six-membered ring that I showed you, protein, DNA, and the different lipids, and I'm going to show you some of those in, in just a minute. So let's talk for a minute about so specific polysaccharides, so these, remember, are the polymer of carbohydrates. So structural polysaccharides, meaning they're providing structural support to an organism, are cellulose. We talked about that plants' cell wall is made of cellulose, so this is a polysaccharide. And the other polysaccharide important in structure is chitin, and this is uh, what the cell wall of fungi are made up of, fungus. Also, when you step on a bug and you hear that exoskeleton go crunch, that's, that's the chitin polysaccharide you're hearing. Now, there are also polysaccharides that are for energy storage. Okay, Glycogen, this is the way that we store our glucose if we have excess glucose. Starch is the way that plants store their excess glucose. So that's why you know, pasta and potatoes and things are high in starch because it's stored. That's how the plants store their extra glucose or sugar. So these are store energy storage, oops, polysaccharides. Okay. All four of these, cellulose, chitin, glycogen, and starch, are polymers of the, the monosaccharide glucose. So you put a whole bunch of glucose molecules together by way of a dehydration reaction, and you're going to have these, cellulose, chitin, glycogen, and starch. Okay, I'm going to show you these structures in just a second, but let's fill these blanks in so we don't have to come back. There are 20 amino acids that serve as the monomer or the building block for proteins. There is a special kind of bond between amino acids when they go through the dehydration reaction to link two amino acids together. The bond that connects them is called a peptide bond. Now, what determines the primary structure of the protein? That is the DNA. And we'll learn that later in the semester. DNA instructs for which amino acid comes first, second, third, fourth, fifth, the order of them. Now, the shape of a protein is very important because all proteins have three-dimensional shape. And I'm going to show you that folding in a minute. If they don't have correct three-dimensional shape, they don't function properly. So we'll look at that in just a second. Actually, let's just go ahead and look at it now. All right, this is an amino acid. This is the monomer of a protein. There are 20 different amino acids. The only difference in the 20 is right here where it says R. So this part's going to be different for each of the 20, and I'll show you some examples in a minute. But an amino acid has a central carbon atom right here. Then it has an amino group. And then it has a carboxyl group. And then it has this R group, which is specific for each amino acid. Let's look for just a second at some examples of amino acids. Now, you don't need to remember the structure of any of these amino acids. I just want you to know generally amino acid has the amino group and the carboxyl group and the R group. But this is just for you to see all of these. So here's the amino group, here's the carboxyl group, and this one is the simplest. Its R group is just a hydrogen atom. But they get very complicated. So, so arginine over here, there's the amino group, there's the carboxyl group, and here is the R group. Okay, it's got a longer chain. Some of the R groups even form rings. Okay, like in tryptophan, which is what is in the when you eat turkey and it makes you sleepy. OK. 
Okay, and I want to show you lastly for proteins, protein structure. Okay, so the primary structure of a protein just means what order are these amino acids linked together in? In other words, is this glycine and then tryptophan and then alanine? What order are they linked? This is designated by the genes. The DNA designates what comes first, what comes second. The secondary structure of a protein means once you have all these amino acids that are bonded in a certain order, what is what we call the local folding? So each amino acid has its own chemistry, right? Some of them are hydrophilic, some are hydrophobic. How do they interact with the amino acids near them? Does it cause them to form these what we call pleated sheets? Does it cause them to form a helical structure? What's the local folding? of the protein. And then the tertiary sure means when you look at the overall 3D shape, all of the alpha helices, all of the beta sheets, all of them together, what does the whole peptide look like? Finally, some proteins have what we call quaternary structure. And that means if there's more than one of these um, amino acid chains that are folded, so two separate polypeptides that come together, that would be quaternary structure. So here's one folded polypeptide and a second one that are interacting together. That would be quaternary structure. Okay, we're almost done, I promise. Um, last group before, actually not the last group, we're going to go back to fats, but nucleic acids, the monomer is the nucleotide. Each nucleotide has three parts to it. It has a sugar, Okay, great. Um, and the sugar can either be what's called a ribose. So I just want, if you hear those terms, I want you to know it means it, a ribose is a type of sugar or a deoxyribose. And when we talk about DNA later in the semester, we'll talk more detail about the differences between these two. But essentially, we've got a sugar, we've got a base, and we've got a phosphate group. The sugar and the phosphate group are the same for the nucleotides, but what's different is in the base. And DNA, the DNA alphabet, has four bases. Okay, it has adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. Now let me spell those out. Adenine, cytosine, guanine and thymine. So in other words, it's like four letters of the DNA alphabet, okay? And they always pair together in a certain way. A always pairs with T, and C always pairs with G. And again, we'll learn more about this later in the semester. Now RNA, so this is the DNA alphabet. RNA has the same alphabet except instead of thymine, RNA has a different base called uracil. Now let's look at a nucleic acid. So this would be this right here is a nucleotide. So this would be the monomer for nucleic acids. Okay, and here's what I want to point out to you. This five-membered ring right here, this is the sugar part portion. So we have three parts, right? Sugar, phosphate, and base. This part here is the phosphate. So all nucleotides have a phosphate, they all have a sugar, and they all have a base. Okay, here's the base. But the base can be one of four letters, right? So it can either be this type of base, adenine, this type of base, guanine, cytosine, or thymine, if we're talking about DNA. If we're talking about RNA, then it would be uracil instead of thymine. So 
just be able to recognize that this whole thing is a nucleotide. And no, that's the phosphate group, which is easy, right? It's got the phosphorus in the middle. This part, this five-membered ring with the oxygen at the top is the sugar. And this portion here is going to be the base. That's, this is the part that changes, right? Whether you're talking about adenine, cytosine, guanine, or thymine. Okay, last couple slides. Um, we want to talk a little bit about the fats. Okay, so first thing I want to show you is we've already talked about phospholipids, but these are steroids, which are a type of lipid. So um, other examples of steroids would be testosterone and estrogen, um, but all steroids have some similarities. So in other words, this multi-ring structure that you see here, is going to be the same for all steroids. Now, the part up here that's coming off of the rings is going to be different depending on which steroid, but this four ring structure is the common characteristic of steroids. Now, I want to talk about a fat, okay, because a fat is a, obviously a type of lipid. And the scientific name for this fat would be a triglyceride. So maybe if you've had blood work done, you've had your triglycerides measured. And so essentially, right, that's measuring the amount of fats. And what is a fat? Well, a fat is a molecule of glycerol that you see here where every one of these carbons gets a fatty acid bonded to it. So just like we saw, that so you can build up a polysaccharide or you can build up a protein with a dehydration reaction by making a new bond. The same thing happens here. So we, we see this fatty acid, there's H2O we're going to lose here, and that will connect that fatty acid right here onto that carbon of glycerol. And we have another dehydration that, that connects a fatty acid here and here. So it's tri because there are three different fatty acids onto this glycerol. So this whole molecule that you see here is what we would call a fat or a triglyceride. Now the type of fatty acid, the length of the carbons, and whether or not we have any carbon-carbon double bonds changes whether or not we're talking about a fat like butter or a fat like olive oil, whether it's solid at room temperature or whether it's liquid at room temperature. And we also talk about fats, whether they are saturated or unsaturated. So what I want you to see about this picture is every carbon, okay, that's in the, these long fatty acid chains, Every single carbon just has a carbon to carbon single bond, which means, remember, carbon is always going to make four bonds. We said that about carbon, it can make four bonds. So if we pick any carbon, let's say this carbon right here in the middle, two of its bonds are taken up to be bonded as part of that chain to other carbons. So it has two bonds left, okay? Both of the bonds that are left are saturated with hydrogens. So this, every carbon on all of these chains, these would be considered a saturated fat because the carbons are saturated with hydrogens. They're holding as many hydrogens as they can. An unsaturated fat would be one that has at least one carbon double bond. And therefore, remember on the other one, there would have been a hydrogen here right, and a hydrogen here. But because of this carbon-carbon double bond, hydrogen can only make four bonds. So we have one point of unsaturation, one point that, that's not filled with hydrogens. So monounsaturated would be what you see here, one point of unsaturation. Polyunsaturated would mean when there's more than one of these double bonds. So typically, saturated fats are like butter, solid at room temperature. Unsaturated fats are like oils that are liquid at room temperature. Now let's talk about a really bad, nasty fat, and that is a trans fat. We know they're bad for us. Okay, let's talk about why they're bad for us. So this up here at the top, 
This is a saturated fat, okay? All the carbons are saturated. An unsaturated fat, like this one here, has a kink in it, right? It folds a certain way, like what would be found in certain oils. A trans fat, however, it still has the double bond, like this one, but it's folded, it, it doesn't bend the fat in the same way as it does in a natural fatty acid. These trans fats, for the most part, there are a few naturally occurring, but for the most part, they're man-made. They take a saturated fat up here, and they chemically add, okay, um, so that they're causing this double bond here. So it's partially hydrogenated is sometimes what they're called in the ingredients. And the kink just works differently. Therefore, our enzymes that break down fats don't recognize this particular shape of the fatty acid. So we have more of a buildup of these types of fats. So they can cause heart disease and other issues. And I believe that that is the end of our review session. So as always, you can email me with any questions.